Welcome to GS Podcast number 89, brought to you by Audible. You know this already. If you want an audio book, an audio version of something that's usually written down, something to put in your ears when you can't use your hands, go to audibletrial.com forward slash GS. And this will allow you to get not only a free audio book that you can keep forever, but a free 30-day trial uh, to their services. Uh, if you decide you don't want to carry on with the service, you still get to keep the audio book. And the best thing is, it helps support this wonderful podcast. Keeps the ad free. Stops me plugging crap that I don't care about. Um, I've got a fantastic guest for this show. Uh, I'll be speaking to Hayda Zaki from the Quilliam Foundation. Um, I really enjoyed our discussion. We touched on a whole host of big issues uh, that, are, that are topical at the moment, from the prevent strategy to Muslim reform to radicalization in our educational system. And just listen to this man speak. Listen to the clarity of his thought, the passion, the way he genuinely cares about the issues and contrast this to the kind of so-called Muslim community leaders they drag out onto our TV and radio whenever there's a, an issue. And um, the way they obfuscate, the way they detract all attention from the ideas uh, and make Muslims the victim in any given situation. Hader clearly motivated by a concern for human rights and I think they're that's the kind of thing we want to empower where we can. So make sure you check out the Quillian Foundation, what they're all about. I've, I've mentioned them on the podcast many a time. I've had Majid on the show. I'm a member myself. Um, you can find them at quilliamfoundation.org. Send some kind words to Hader on Twitter too. Some follow-up questions, just some general love. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. You can find him at Haydar Zaki One. Hey guys, H A Y D A R Zaki Z A K I One. You can keep up to date on this podcast and read some recent blogs that I've uh, tapped together over at gspellchecker.com. Enjoy. It's a great pleasure to welcome Haydar Zaki of the Quilliam Foundation to the GS Podcast. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, great. I'm uh, looking forward to speaking to you. It's always nice to to get into Islamic reform with somebody. So it's a fascinating topic. Many mixed views from my listeners, actually. So it'll be interesting to see what your perspective is on that. Um, but I thought maybe before we delve into a whole host of topical issues maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and yourself yeah um so my name is Haydar Zeki. i am quilliam's outreach and programs officer um really i was fascinated by ideas i realized that the phenomenon of radicalization is an ideas driven uh, issue so it compelled me to work in organizations like quilliam uh automatically attracted to organizations like quilliam because they are really active and more of a do tank as well as a think tank um Upon coming to Quilliam, I really wanted to help develop the outreach strategy and the outreach projects to develop grassroots resilience to extremism. Um, namely, I found that it was in universities that was a main priority. Uh, I felt that students, being a recent graduate myself, I, f I understood that there were real issues of censorship and extremism apologia rising in universities. And I spoke with students all across the country um, and they felt the same way. And so we developed focus groups and outreach projects um, to develop Quilliam University societies and Quilliam related projects like Right to Debate in order to push back against censorship and extremism apologia in order to render the appeal 
extremist ideologies. Great. I mean, that's really positive stuff. I mean, what I've noticed there straight away is that you you single out ideas as a causal factor in, in radicalization. And that's surprisingly quite a big hurdle for a lot of people to leap, isn't it? They don't tend to want to recognize the role of ideology in radicalization. And I was wondering, why do you think they're so keen to put the focus on things like upbringing, um, you know, social economic yeah. factors, which I'm, which I'm sure play a part, but they'll they'll push them things to the forefront of the discussion, but will discount ideology at all cost, it seems. Yeah, I think there are two main reasons for this, Stephen. The first is that um, they use a lot of evidences in social sciences, and social sciences cannot really give evidences for the phenomenon of a link between ideas and violence. Ironically, those people who bring up that academic uh, discussion into that, saying that there is no evidence for someone believing in killing the Jews and someone killing the Jews, um, ironically actually see that there is a great link between anti-Muslim rhetoric and anti-Muslim violence. Um, <laughs> so they're picking and choosing, they're cherry picking what they believe is uh, where they're getting evidence from, from their social sciences. And uh, so that's become one thing. I mean, that is a rhetoric that is repeated constantly. There is no empirical evidence for, uh, for what you're saying. But it's common sense evidence. Uh, the idea that if you dehumanize X community, then it would lend itself to violence. I think the key word here is lend itself. The key word, sorry. It lends itself to violence. It doesn't cause violence, but it lends itself to the mindset of violence. The second most important reason why I think this has happened is that it's a very difficult dis discussion to have. Um, if you take the problem really is m massive uh, it's, 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 if you have FOSIS, which is the organization the umbrella organization connected to every single ISOC in the country or most ISOCs in the country or if that's not all, student unions isn't it students union yeah, so Islamic societies and in 2006 their president uh, said that Hizb al-Tahrir are a mainstream Muslim organization that do mainstream incredible work I mean, Hizb al-Tahrir was the organization my boss, Majid Namaz, was a part of. And they campaigned for Sharia law and a caliphate that would absolutely render any meaning of human rights, individual liberty and religious freedom. If you have that much of, if you have that far reaching of a problem, sometimes it's easier to take the simplistic route of blaming the other. And so what we see is, is that the, instead of having a frank discussion on extremist ideologies, people are more comfortable to have a discussion on foreign policy, on the West's involvement and aid of Saudi Arabia. Um, and this comes at two main detriments. The first is, it really does make a mockery to people like me. I mean, just today, there's a picture circulating around the internet. I don't know if it's been uh, verified of a woman who is being sold to ISIS um, captors in Iraq. Wow. What did she have to do about foreign policy? <laughs> yes. I mean, what did she have to do about foreign policy? And, uh, and it's a really, uh, seeing a picture like that really does um, put an extra wound in my heart because I'm Iraqi originally myself. So that's the first thing. The second thing as well is that it completely puts our head in the sand. We don't want to talk about it. We don't even want to name it. I have family members who are Iraqi, so they first-hand know, they first-handedly know the damage of ISIS and what it's done to us. And they'd still rather talk about ISIS as some American Zionist conspiracy, ISIS standing for Israeli secret intelligence services, than they would to actually clarify that actually this is something to do with Islam and that this frank discussion has to take place because there is appeal for this ideology. So I think those are the two reasons why that's taken place, why people haven't had that respect for the link between ideas and violence and the two that the two hangovers of that as well, which has been detrimental to the cause of countering extremism. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, to pass a little time on my morning commute today, I did a little exercise on Twitter. I, I tried to locate people who were vocally anti-Zionist and they either, they either had it in their profiles or they'd send tweets about it. Then I'd mm. search the same people for words such as 9-11 false flag and inside job. <laughs> and the, yeah. uh, the correlation yeah. was was present. It was almost guaranteed. Um, so it's, it's really interesting. But I mean, talking about what you mentioned there, I mean, it ties back into student unions and this idea that foreign policy is to blame. I mean, that brings me swiftly on to um, Mali Boatia, who's the, the president mm -hmm. of the National Union of Students here. And mm -hmm. I read, I don't know if you read that interview with her in The Guardian. I did, yes. Okay, which is a bit, from my perspective, it was a, it was a bit of a car crash. Um, so we've got this, this policy in the UK, or it's not so 
you know, doing so well at the moment is prevent the prevent strategy. And it's, I would challenge you on it uh, if it's not doing too well, but that's another point. Well, yeah, sorry. In, in terms yeah. of in terms of public opinion, vocal public opinion, should I say? It's not. I mean, he seems to be. He seems to lack a a, a lot of Muslim support, especially. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would say. Uh, yeah, I would okay, say that, so, that's a valid criticism. Yeah. So she she was asked. I mean, this is the problem I have with people who who are critical of the prevent strategy. They'll be asked, "Well, what what's your alternative? What would you like to see?" Yeah. And her instant reaction was, "Well, we should concentrate." on our foreign policy. And, and I would suggest that's a complete red herring. That still doesn't deal with the issue of homegrown radicalization, does it? No, not at all. And actually, um, on this particular case, I'd like to give an anecdote. So I was at a um, prevent conference at UCL, which Malia was uh, a part of the panel. And the interesting thing is, although they don't give an alternative, Malia and the NUS are in a very unique position because the NUS does counter extremism of sort, what they call countering fascism. So they do think about these issues. Nonetheless, so I asked this simple question. So let's get this straight. If someone says no Muslims allowed in the country, it is seen as fascist, that belief is seen to lead to violence, and you go as far to ban it. Now, I'm a liberal, so I wouldn't ban it. I'd rather challenge it, and we can talk about right to debate later. But I see the logic that she's identified a problem there with that anti-Muslim fascist rhetoric. Sure. On the other hand, if someone says, in my ideal state, apostates would be killed, it is safe spaced under religious rights, it is seen as just a conservative belief, just their belief, and is even worked with. Now, I'm not even joking. These are the organizations of speakers they work with on certain anti-prevent campaigns. So I said to her, of course you're against uh, the prevent strategy because the prevent strategy looks at both far-right fascism and Islamic, uh, Islamist theocratic fascism. You know, you, you ban one form of fascism where you work with the other. And it just did make, not make any sense, and she couldn't answer that question. Now, that video of me asking that question is uploaded online. Uh, she pretended she didn't un- understand the question. I had to ask it again through the courtesy of the host, and she just regurgitated the you no know, platform policy that the NUS has. They couldn't, she couldn't fathom it, I, I couldn't believe. Um, and that has real consequences that I'm sure we will be talking about later on. But my point is, there is an anti-prevent lobby, no doubt, and it comes with an agenda. And that is the agenda, is that they see far-right, fascist, anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric as a problem, so far so that they see anyone criticizing Islam to equate to far-right rhetoric, which is wrong in itself. But they are so thin-skinned on that issue, yet they are so blasé and so uh, reluctant to acknowledge that if the same thing is justified conservatively through Islam, then that is not a problem. Uh, that, that is a problem. I mean, just to give one, just to kind of nail that point one last time. So in that same article and interview that you're mentioning, she states that it is rightly so that Julie Bindel was uh, no platformed because of her accused transphobia. Hmm. So why are they now working with all these Islamist speakers who are not only transphobic, homophobic, <laughs> sexist, uh, abusive, um, calling for the deaths of apostates, um, calling Jews monkeys? Why is it that that's okay? So if you now it's come to that point where if you want to be no platform from the NUS, be quote unquote transphobic. But if you want to be a hero standing up against the government, be transphobic, but say it's your conservative religious belief. Yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I don't know if you saw the whole fiasco with Mariam Namazi a while back when she was trying to give yeah, of course, yeah. a talk um, and she was disrupted by some of the ISOC brothers. And it was it was incredible to see the feminist societies, the LGBT societies, all come out in support of these young Muslim men who would just try to shut this uh, female ex-Muslim down. It's it's quite an extraordinary. It's kind of like this horseshoe effect of politics, isn't it? Where the far left and the far right tend to meet each other, looking each other in the eye. Um, I mean, how how big of a problem is radicalization in in our universities? Do you think? Um. So there are two issues when we take a look at uh, universities. So the first, of course, is, as you picked up on, is radicalization. Um, universities have always naturally been a good pool for people to recruit from. Um, again, my boss, Majid Nawaz, used to use universities in particular to recruit from. Um, it is where leaders are shaped and ideas are flowing around. And it is also that coming of age moment, which all makes things very ripe um, for people who are vulnerable to radicalization. Um, we have seen some of the ones, the terrorists who have come the closest, shall we say, as in to committing acts of terror, have tended to be from universities. So the underwear bomber, um, Abdul Matalib from UCL, uh, who literally 
was on the brink of committing mass murder up in the airline, but it was only because he couldn't strike the fuse of the bomb attached to his underwear. He came from UCL and he was quite prominent in the ISOC there. If we take a look at um, King's College also, recently one of their ISOC members was arrested on the charges of trying to take a gun and shoot policemen in an ISIS-inspired attack. Um, so that is an issue. Radicalization is an issue. The second issue, though, is that if you have, like we have now today, a regressive left which borders on communism and Islamist alliance gripping all of universities, now I'm not just saying it's a, it's a dominant strand, it's a mainstream strand, I'm saying it really is gripping most, um, if not all, student political activists then that will have real-life consequences on the outside political sphere. Every university, sorry, universities have historically been the places which springboard or even give birth to political movements. Bad, like Islamist and communist-styled um, movements, but also good, liberal ones too. Now, if you have this movement gr growing su at such a, such a pace in universities, you can bet your bottom dollar that it's going to have a, a real-life effect in public. And so now it is no surprise for me that our second party, the party rivaling the incumbent conservative party, is the Corbyn party. That borders, that is, I mean, you have your shadow chancellor right standing up and saying, I am a Marxist and I welcome the recession. This didn't come out of anywhere. This didn't come out of anywhere. This came out from universities, I believe. I truly believe that. And the struggle here now is to try and get the public to realize that this isn't just student politics. This isn't just about students banning sombreros and banning songs in students' unions. But it's actually have real, it actually has real-life consequences on our liberal values. That we are now having an institution being gripped by censorship of what they believe is to be right, like an intellectual mafia dictating to students what they believe is right and wrong. The second is now we have apologia for extremism, which has all sorts of problems attached to it, like the lending of violence and the damning and forsaking of those brown people who are fighting for universal human rights because they're not seen as authentic. And the third, of course, is anti-Semitism, because all three forms of extremism that are rising, Islamist, far left and far right, I hate to say it, aren't too friendly to the Jewish people. <laughs> and that is now showing itself in students' unions and real life politics. So unless the public starts to wake up and realize this is, an, a ser this is a serious institution to be working with and this is something serious that we have to be involved in, then it will continue. It will continue to be a problem on both those fronts of radicalization and developing regressive political movements with horrendous vision that will be at the detriment of the central liberal ground. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I can kind of see exactly what you mean there and how all them pieces have come together and the knock-on effect it's had in politics and society in general. But I suppose what's the response? Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that you'd be keen on banning regressive uh, societies within university. Is it just a case of providing greater challenge? Is it a case of letting people know they shouldn't be afraid to stand up to these things? Where, how do you approach it? So... Uh um, this was one of the projects I developed through the Uke William University program. It's called Right to Debate, uh, with the two, uh, number two, because we're edgy and cool. <laughs> and, right. uh, Down with the kids. <laughs> um, and essentially, we have four outcomes that we try to, to produce, which is debate over censorship, and we caveat that with being legal speakers, i.e. speakers who don't call for violence, etc. Uh, debate over uncontested platforms for said extremist speakers, and a policy that is clear and uniform to apply to all. Um, so what we do is we work with each student's society and each student's collective that want to develop a policy which reflect on those four outcomes to ensure that we both expand freedom of speech and ensure freedom of speech and challenge bigotry instead. Now, extremism in our definition are speakers that have called for or are calling for the removal of rights based on uh, a community's inalienable traits or non-violent religious political belief. By inalienable trait, I mean, of course, such things as race, sexuality, and gender. Right. So, calling, so for example, if a speaker is saying that um, in the ideal state, Jews will have to pay a tax, or another one saying that they would have to be killed for uh, their beliefs, that would obviously constitute extremism. So what happens, when this hap what happens uh, in this case is that if a speaker does come in with these views, that the students' union ensures that contest takes place. And it does so by using one of three mechanisms. It can either bring a contesting speaker to have a debate take place, or it can um, give time delegated to students who want to challenge in questions and answers, or it could provide an independent moderator that asks three to four questions on their views. Now, why is this so? 
the first thing is these extremist speakers, when they call for the removal of rights, have to first dehumanize uh, this aforementioned community. So, for example, I can't say that apostates have to pay a tax if I didn't first justify and dehumanize, sorry, justify the dehumanization of that community. I couldn't say apostates should be killed if I didn't first almost dehumanize them. And it is that dehumanized route that we have to try and uproot through civil challenge and debate. Um, the second thing, yeah, sorry, so that's the main point, is trying to um, take, the, take away that point and also trying to demonstrate to students what it is these speakers are saying. And what happens is a lot of the time is that these extremist speakers don't come into these university lecture halls and spout their extremist rhetoric. No. What they do is they talk about it in a very peaceful and loving way, mm. which then legitimizes them to the students, and then legitimize, and then they can therefore thereafter talk about things like cutting uh, a woman's clitoris in the name of FGM. Right. Um, so what it, that does is it breaks the echo chamber and makes students question and put that neat seed of doubt in their minds and go, hold on a second, are they really human rights? As a feminist, should I really be supporting the man who says uh, FGM is permissible? So it has that. It has that effect. And that's the theory behind it. Okay. I mean, obviously, this is a very pro-free speech, free expression movement, but it's a very difficult subject in England, especially with our hate speech laws and our libel laws are particularly notorious. And I suppose it might bring us round to someone like Anjab Chowdhury. I was wondering what your view is on that. This is someone who would managed to keep on the right side of the law for the longest time in his rhetoric and then was finally caught out by inviting support for a prescribed group. I mean, do you think that was a step too far for him? No, I think that was the right step and it was way overdue. Um, and he wouldn't classify as someone that should be debated through right to debate because he's illegal. Uh, he was prosecuted for, it wasn't even speech, it was literally inciting hatred and recruiting. Uh, and a lot of people have lost their lives because of the recruitment that he was a part of. So he wouldn't classify, and I think it was a long time coming. And I think it took a little bit of common sense. And I think it was almost everybody was on board uh, with seeing him prosecuted for that. Yeah. So, But the point is about right to debate is that there will be speakers with horrific views that you will post to me and say, should this guy even really be given a platform? And I have two alternatives um, to it. I mean, the first is literally I can let them speak uncontested like many Islamist speakers do, uh, many extremist speakers do on university campuses today. Those low-level names. I mean, Anjum Chaudhry is almost a celebrity in this field, but we have loads of low-level names that go passing in and out like revolving doors and go in there with the same effect, essentially. So we can either do that, which is an apologist way of doing things, or we can either look at banning them completely. Now, as, as appealing that, as that may look, it doesn't actually deal with the issue. I mean, what you're going to have is the speakers come popping straight back up onto YouTube. And believe me, with the way these guys look, I mean, they can do with some of the editing and glitz and glamour of YouTube. <laughs> um, so I would rather have a spotlight shone on them and have people challenging them on yeah. four or five of their points or even have another speaker challenging them on their points so that the students have to hear what it is their views are. And the students can hear the rebuttals and refutations to it. So I would rather have that challenged and I would rather again reiterate that no civil right was ever won through banning. But it took that conversation to take place and it took people to realize just how ugly and extreme intolerance and illiberalism is and started to replace that sphere with more good ideas of universal human rights and individual liberty. So that is the theory behind right to debate. And I think it is the only way that is historically justified and theoretically and morally justified in really countering extremism. Okay. I mean, since we're on freedom of expression and I've got you, I'm going to pick you up on a, a really unrelated point, but it's, it'd be fascinating to get your opinion. And that's uh, ex-England legend Paul Gascoigne has been in the news. for. Um, he's, well, he's been prosecuted. He's had to pay £2,000 in total for what was described as a racist joke, at, um, a gig. And my, my personal opinion is, that, you know, it was an injustice, not I mean, an injustice for the man who endured it. I'm sure he was humiliated, uh, but I kind of really struggled to get on board with criminalising speech. And I just wondered where you fell on this issue, if you are aware of it. Yeah, so I w I'm not too aware of the case that you're talking about in particular for Paul Gascon. But on this particular case of should we criminalise hate speech, such as racist speech? And again, I would say no. I mean, it will always exist. I mean, banning it 
You can okay. So what you can do is make things more difficult. I think there is a there is a sphere to talk about. Maybe we should we you can put fines and so on, and maybe publicly shame them and so on. That is a different discussion. But if you are asking me, should we ban it? Then I would unequivocally say no. Again, for the same reasons that you haven't actually dealt with the issue. Racism wasn't solved because we banned it. Racism was solved because we had that discussion and everyone came together and challenged it and rendered it uh, intellectually unappealing. That is the way we do things, and it also leads to a very slippery slope of what it is that should be banned and what it is that it shouldn't be banned. Yeah, that sounds sensible to me. I mean, just to circle back a little bit, because I'm not sure we picked it up in as great a detail as I'd like. We, we talked about the Prevent program. So maybe you could just explain what the Prevent program actually is, given how much it is misrepresented. Yeah. So the Prevent strategy, uh, which has taken many forms, so I'm going to speak it at, at its current form, um, is a strategy that is made to deal with extremist ideologies. It understands that extremist ideologies um, play the mood music for terror- terrorism and violent extremism, that there is a, there is a link um, between nonviolent extremism and violent extremism, not a causal link, but again, that lend itself approach to it. And so what it tries to do is try to ensure that challenge takes place for extremism and it makes sure that through a civil society approach, ex- uh, civil society can actually go and forth and challenge extremism. So essentially what it looks like in practice at the local level is that the teachers and those who are already have safeguarding duties, such as a teacher who has the safeguarding duty of um, intervening if they see one of their students being sexually exploited, now has the duty of ensuring that they intervene when they see signs of radicalization. So really it is a common sense approach to it. So if you see a student that is being groomed, and uh, the process is much like grooming, to a radical radical movement, then the teacher will intervene and the teacher will use the relevant mechanisms like the referral system to ensure that a critical thinking and interventionist strategy can be put in place. That is really what it is at, at the crux of it. I suppose the common argument against that we'll hear from people is it's it's overreach it's it's a nanny state it's people singling out muslims specifically and i was wondering what what would you say to people who made the argument i mean for me it's it's so ridiculous so on the first point i mean really all it is is a common sense approach to safeguarding why is it that you should have safeguarding duties to um, intervene on the sexual exploitation of your students but you shouldn't have one if there are students being groomed to isis that this teacher should just be standing, standing back or groomed to far-right extremism. Now, don't forget, 50%, only 50% of referrals are Muslim-related or um, Islamic-related, I should say, Islamist-related. The other 50% are non-Islamist-related, include far-right extremism and other forms of extremism. So to not have that safeguarding duty, to say that a teacher has safeguarding duties, but we're going to completely turn a blind eye, to uh, the safeguarding duty against extremism and radicalization to violent extremism is a ridiculous concept and again comes from this agenda that only sees far-right fascism as a problem but not their own Islamist theocratic fascism as a problem. To this point where people say that it stigmatizes Muslims, I can cite the page in the Prevent Duty Guidance which says, don't refer anybody for um, devotion of faith. Don't refer anybody for the devotion of faith. That's what it says, for the outwards devotion of faith. That is not a point for someone's referral. It says it right there. And I've also known that the people who develop the workshops to uh, the workshops for prevent to the teachers and relevant safeguard, uh, safeguarding practitioners, that they consistently say, do not refer anybody because of their faith, because of their Islamic faith and so on. I mean, they have repeated this at such a level at so many times that it's becoming ridiculous now to have this conversation that it stigmatizes Muslims. The only time it stigmatizes Muslims is when this anti-prevent lobby keeps telling students that prevent is all about referring someone if they're fasting. Prevent is all about referring someone if they're growing a beard. And the tragic consequence of that is, is that if that student believes that if he grows a beard, he'll be referred, then it might as well say that on the paper. But I quite frankly can really, I mean, it's really frustrating. I can show (laughs) you the page number and and cite it where it says don't refer anybody for... um, Outward devotion of faith. And then to further add to that, the referral system, which is known as channel, has so many safeguarding mechanisms in place to ensure that the right referrals get through and the the erroneous referrals get rejected. 80% of referrals are rejected. So all these things are put in place. And and I know a lot of the workers at the local council level who are um, implementing Prevent and the teachers who are doing so too. And they are doing such a fantastic job. And it really is just this vocal minority that are trying to 
drum up that it is all anti-Muslim and so on. I mean, another thing to consider though as well is that, uh, and this could be more of a personal testimonial, but from many of the teachers and practitioners that I've spoken to, they are actually quite happy with Prevent. And they see it as a common sense approach. The problem is, is that this small vocal minority that keeps speaking in the media, keeps speaking about how Prevent is an issue, Prevent is an issue, Prevent is an issue. Now, I'm not trying to deny that within the Muslim communities, there is a dominant mainstream anti-prevent stream, but I'm saying in the wider framework, in the wider, in the you know every other communities around the country, people tend to get it, and there are Muslims as well that are growing who can't who get the idea of it too. Well, that's that's positive at least. I mean, so obviously we you've touched on this this anti-prevent group who just seem to be against any focus on extremism within their community in general they just don't don't seem to want it and they they'll kind of spin a yarn and an agenda to try and delegitimize it which which is is understandable if not helpful uh, but I, I do think maybe as well is it possible that the prevent strategy has a bit of a pr problem in, in the way in which it communicates itself like you've just mentioned you like you can say you can reference pages and quote chapter and verse as it were mm-hmm. but i mean i suppose that that could be down to the fact you've got an invested interest in this strategy to the average joe maybe do you think the government could do better to to market yeah, it in a sense absolutely um and the government have done they are taking the right steps needed i mean they are trying to diversify uh the partners they would work with to deliver prevent related projects and so they are bringing organizations that counter homophobia counter racism they are bringing all these different organizations from different spheres to demonstrate that extremism is a multifaceted problem that must be dealt with in a multifaceted way because extremism at the end of the day is homophobic, is racist. Uh, and so relevant organizations that have been doing this work are now coming in and delivering prevent-related projects. And so I think that's a very welcome move. Now, uh, the problem is is that uh, the anti-prevent lobby have a lot of grassroots um, grassroots reach. Sorry. So when you're talking about CAGE, when you're talking about FOSIS, when you're talking about these organizations that have such a grassroots reach, they're able to really start dictating the narrative and start controlling the narrative around prevent. And it is no surprise that when they do discuss prevent, like they will do tomorrow in a preventing prevent um, circus, that it is an echo chamber, that it has no one critical to their views, no one critical to to push back. It is just a echo chamber of reaffirming that how prevent is there to demonize every Muslim and da da da. And no, that comes at no surprise. And so when you look at the other side, people like um, Quilliam, um, other organizations that are doing good work to try and say, actually, um, we need to counter extremist ideologies. And the prevent strategy, yes, may not be perfect, but it's the best one we have so far. And if anyone's happy to give an alternative, please do. Um, we are building a grassroots reach, but it, historically we don't have as strong of a grassroots reach as the other side do. And so although a counterculture is building and is mobilizing and is moving, it is inevitably going to be more quiet in this somewhat shouting match between people who are for countering extremism and people who are against it entirely. Well, maybe you could tell me a little bit about Quilliam in general and why you decided that's an organization you'd be happy to work with. I mean, full disclosure, I am a Quilliam member myself. I, you know, I have the t-shirt. Oh, thank you for joining. I'm one of the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> one of the gang. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite supportive of, of the work you do in it. But I mean, what strikes me in particular is that it appears to be one of the only organizations doing this kind of work, which is quite disconcerting. But I mean, you can maybe alleviate my fears in that respect, perhaps, but maybe explain why you felt this is the organization for you. I felt that it was the organization for me because it had a very clear message. I found it very clear. Um, It wasn't a simple message. It wasn't a feel good message, but a very clear message. And it is that we have to counter extremist ideologies that make a mockery to the value of human rights. And we need to do so by creating a civil society response to unapologetically promote universal human rights. And that faith can be a part of that promotion of human rights. That is the key message. Now, you can call Quilliam any name under the sun. I mean, there's a lot of things. Uh, Quilliam is a controversial organization because it is so forward thinking and forward stepping. And there will be many names that are thrown at us, but I don't believe you can call us uh, inconsistent. I don't believe you can call us inconsistent. We have stuck by that message through thick and thin. And so that is why, that is one of the main things that drove me to Quilliam. The other reason that drove me to Quilliam is that I am fascinated by ideas. I understand how ideas can shape states. I understand how ideas can shape behavior. I understand how ideas, if good ideas would lead to good vision, which would lead to good policies and the vice versa. Quilliam is an ideas organization. It understands the value of ideas and the value of free speech. It does not 
call for countering extremism through legislation. It does not call for countering extremism through abandoning ideas. It calls for countering extremism through free speech and through the discussion of ideas. Now, that is a beautiful message that drew me and allowed me to quit him. Um, that would, that at the crux of it was why I joined Quilliam as opposed to um, any other think tank that I saw. Uh, but the reason why I was drawn towards counter extremism work in particular is, is that I, so I, I, I am a Muslim from Iraqi origin and I grew up by seeing both uh, anti Muslim uh, extremism that was inflicted upon me, uh, people calling me names and so on after 9 11 and kind of bullying, but also Islamist extremism. So I was uh, in a form of sectarianism. So in my school, um, it was obvious from the way I prayed. And so people would, I remember uh, a bit of sectarianism um, was happening there. And ultimately, though, the one thing that really drew me to this cause was upon seeing what happened in Iraq uh, with the war. So I was against the war. Um, but what I saw was all these people. I mean, so what I saw from the consequence of the Iraq war was that Shia was fighting Sunni, tribes were fighting tribes, everyone was fighting each other. It was bad foreign policy from the West. And so it was a mess. And my diagnosis for it was that actually we need to build a secular state, an all for one and one for all, one that guarantees the rights of your brothers and sisters in Iraq because we are such a uh, diverse region. These extremists took that same grievance and justified even more division in the name of theocracy. It made no sense. So I was there grieving the Iraq war, and I saw these people who quite clearly didn't care about the Iraqi civilians, but only wanted to manipulate and hijack that grievance to justify even more division. How anybody could see something like the Iraq war and say, the, re the way that we will fix this problem is by more division through a theocracy, I will never know. And so what I began to see uh, quite clearly was these organizations like Unite Against Fascism, like the ones championing against the Iraq war, being mm. dominated by these authoritarians, these like, like ex bathies and by these theocrats. And it was at the, at the silence, at the people in the middle, the people who were secular democratic, the people who were wanting to actually see a stable and positive vision for Iraq and the Middle East as a whole. It came at our detriment. Um, so it was those two reasons, I guess. Yeah. One of the reasons that I kind of, I like to try and support liberal Muslim dissidents in a way is, is the fact that there's this is sort of a community thing there that doesn't tend to exist in other groups where it becomes actually a danger in many ways to stand for a lot of liberal values. It's almost seen as antithesis to a con, you know a conservative interpretation of Islam. And I was disappointed to hear that Majid had posted the other day on Facebook that he'd been... Um, kind of accosted in London and he's, he's made reference to other attacks that have happened on the staff of Quilliam and I was just yeah. wondering how you feel about that and your, your general safety and, and risks involved in, in speaking up for these liberal values I'll be um, I think the thing that might make people reluctant to join this cause and this is not just Muslims but non-Muslims as well is the social cost of joining such a cause hmm. and because right now Everyone has the badge of race, um, anti-racism. Everyone has the badge of anti-homophobia. And that, became, that came out because of those few leaders, those visionaries of people who fought homophobia and fought racism at a time when it wasn't mainstream. And those are the badges we wear today. Unfortunately, today, people are pacified and think it suffices that they have those badges and that that's it. That's human rights finished. The, the book is closed. Now, what I'm calling for is, no, we have, we have to get the next badge. The next badge of actually challenging all the three forms of ide extremist ideologies that we now face. Islamism, far-right extremism, and far-left. All of which make a huge mockery to human rights in their own way. And liberalism in their own way. We need to be more thicker-skinned. We need to be thicker-skinned. We need to be more visionary. We need to be more leader-like. We need to be more muscular in our unapologetic value of liberalism. Now, that will come at a social cost, no doubt, in particular universities. But I'm saying that if you truly are worried about the climate we see today, which mimics a lot of 1930s Germany in that far right and far left are competing for political influence at the cost of the center ground, and you, are, and you care about human rights, you are not some social justice warrior who speaks of human rights, but actually you actually care about human rights and that the individual and universal application of it, then you will at least speak about it. We're not asking for anything more but then just to speak about it, to be more active, to write about it and so on. Um, of course, it will come back with its own pushback. 
But if we are to try and progress human rights like those brave people before us did in, against racism and homophobia, then we have to start being a little bit more robust too. And so that's why I can't, thank you for um, joining the Quilliam Circle. Um, I'm very, and that's why I think it's so important to build and build, build networks. Um, the one thing I wanted to state here as well is that we liberals, we have to realize that we are really, really difficult to try and mobilize. Um, if I can give an analogy, liberals are like cats. They just move all over the place. And they can sometimes allow little differences on tax policies drive such a wedge that they'll never work together again. The extremists don't have this problem. The extremists are like sheep. They're very easy to mobilize. They're very easy to walk in one direction. They're not critical thinkers. They, are, they follow dogma. Now, to the liberals, I say, our main fundamental vision is at stake here. Not policy areas, not left wing, right wing, but our, our key vision and our key value of human rights. Nothing can be born out of good, nothing good can be born out of bad vision. So it's our key values here at stake. We have to start coming together and picking our battles and start siding with our ideals over our identities. So our ideals that bind us together, like women's rights, like individual liberty, like innovation, those are the things that identify us now. Not necessarily what our gender is, what our sexuality is, what our race is, what our faith is, what our political affiliation is. We need to be an ideals over identities culture. This will be the only way that we can start pushing back against the forms of extremism that have already got a head start. Now, just to show you how dangerous such a uh, competition is, when we look at the Arab Spring, every movement started out as secular democratic, no? Mm. And it ended up as Islamist. And it is because these liberals are so difficult to mobilize as opposed to these extremists who are so dogmatically moving in one direction. So what's needed is the liberals to come together is the liberals to start understanding that there is something really at stake here? And is the liberals to start saying that we have to start connecting our networks together, start working together, start being socially active together uh, and coming together? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. I think I listened to a Sam Harris podcast recently where he he mentioned that the sort of leftist liberals eat their own in a way that those on the right just don't. Yeah. Okay, Hader. Well, I have a few questions from Twitter as well, if you're happy to run through those with me. Yeah, absolutely, please. Okay, some ranty beige co-host from the Manchester area called Iram Ramzan has asked, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how much do the Zios pay you? <laughs> <laughs> um, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's an interesting point there because, I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I just get called a racist or a fascist or a word to that effect when I insult um, or, you know, criticise Islamism or Islam in general. You, on the other hand, are more likely to be called uh, an Uncle Tom, a Zionist, whatever, you know. A whatever. house Muslim. house Muslim, it's yeah. Rap, though, but, um, but there is a serious point here. Yeah. Um, just as from an anecdote, again, um, so my sister goes to a university that's not very uh, hos- not very hospitable to call him. No, it doesn't really will it down, I know. But, uh, <laughs> but she once called me and said to me, what is this? You're getting, you know, Israeli Zionist money and why do you hate Muslims? And did it. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, you know, all my friends are telling me where you work and stuff. And what is this? And I said to her, you live with me. <laughs> <laughs> I said to her, you live with me. Yeah. So you know what I'm, what I'm like. And you also know what my situation is like. You know, okay, I am a liberal Muslim, but you know we have family who are quite conservative and traditional. And I have never, I will never tolerate to see, as much, even, I'm not calling my family Islamists, but when there are Islamists, I will never tolerate any form of bigotry through speech or even violence. That, I, that, that is something that I will stand vehemently against. So how could you say that to me? And she said, oh yeah. But what it really demonstrated to me is how powerful um, these student circles and these kind of movements can be that it actually it actually convinced someone who lives with me that's incredible isn't it i mean it just goes to show the kind of misinformation that's been spread about the quilliam foundation and i, I often think that a lot of people going into conversations with uh, Majid when he's, he's doing media have tended to have got all their information beforehand from these places, these blogs and, and articles that are essentially just smears. I mean, I don't know. I think he, he was on Australian TV with that lady. Um, I forgot her name now, but she just seemed to 
accused him of all sorts of things and he was essentially just pushing for the idea of anti-theocracy. I don't know if you saw yeah. that. Sarah I mean, Saleh, I think she was this called. Is the, this is the ironic thing. The far left, again, in their good intentions, what they're trying to do is trying to stop anti-Muslim bigotry. Start, stop wanting to stop uh, violent speech and bigoted speech towards Muslims. And I, and I think that's um, something to be applauded for. But the problem is, is if, that, if they're siding for and apologizing for these Islamists who call for the beating of wives, who call for the penalization of homose- throwing off homosexuals of buildings and so on, then they're only going to drive up anti-Muslim bigotry. They're only going to drive up this image that Muslims are some kind of barbarians. I mean, if we see it like this, we've got the far right who try to reduce Muslims as Muslims are barbarians, right? We now have a far left that say Muslims are barbarians, but let's see why. Oh, it's their culture. Oh, it's just because they're different. Oh, it's just who they are. What can we do about it? Now, if you're trying to really really try to deconstruct anti-Muslim bigotry. Why not try to work with Muslims and try to promote the message that you can be a Muslim and be British. You can be Muslim and a valuer of human, universal human rights. Because that's the driver between both um, Islamist extremists and the far right, which is that Muslims can't be compatible with Britain, for example, or the West, or human, human right values. So why don't we try and build, pull down that vehicle as opposed to keep helping prop it up by putting our heads down in the sand? That is the only way to solve anti-Muslim bigotry. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's funny. Like like I was saying, my my p- critics, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty vanilla. It's pretty straightforward. I find critics of uh, liberal reformer reformist Muslims, especially, incredibly bonkers. I mean, I'll give you an example. I don't think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but since I had Majid on this show, I get an email once a week, I think, and it's from the same chap usually under different identities. He'll sometimes tweet me as well or leave messages on my blog. And he's absolutely 100% convinced that Majid is a sleeper cell jihadist just waiting for that one moment oh, yeah. to peel back yeah, the mask. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> that's that. you've got to be a certain brand of paranoid to adhere to that kind of belief, surely. Absolutely. And uh, it just shows that we must be doing something right. If the Islamists think we're trying to destroy Islam and advocate for anti-Muslim bigotry, and there's far-right paranoids who that say that we're <laughs> Trojan horse jihadists. Um, <laughs> Biding so your time. We must be doing something right. We must be doing something right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's no answer to that kind of thing, more, is there? There's not, there's not, yeah, I mean, what, what more can you say? Okay, well, next question from someone called Anne the Mean Meanie. Now, I've, I'm not familiar with this one myself, but she's, or yeah, she suggested or asked, what are your thoughts on Jalal Udin's son apparently saying ISIS supporters are posing as charity workers? Now, Jalal Udin was that poor imam murdered in Rochdale, I believe, by the, yeah. the ISIS supporters. I don't know if you've heard this claim or if you have any thoughts on it. Yeah, so uh, I can't really comment and verify that accusation because I haven't seen the evidence ahead of me and I don't think it's um, disclosed to the public. But what I, what I can say is that, and my hypo- hypothesis really is, is that I can believe so. I can believe that so that um, a lot of recruiters for ISIS and even other jihadist groups in Syria are posing as charity workers, are posing as heroes to the Syrian people. Uh, that is one of the ways that they drummed up a lot of support for their cause in Syria. By, by using the real reality of the harsh treatment of Assad to his own people, and then manipulating it to a jihadist cause. Um, so I can, believe, I can very much believe that to be the case. I just can't comment on it because I haven't seen the evidence for it. Barnet Humanist has asked a good question. Where does Prevent Program get its research from? If hmm, It's an interesting one. Okay. Um, so a lot of think tanks like Quilliam, um, you know, recommend policies and develop research projects aimed at what are the best practices to counter extremism. Of course, it varies. I mean, there's obviously Henry Jackson as well that also brings in its own um, direction and every direction changes. So I think the government pay close attention to what think tanks are telling them, what affluent think tanks are telling them, influential think tanks, sorry. And, um, and also must be, I, I, must, I would only presume that their own um, form of uh, experts and their own form of experts and their own, probably their own in-house uh, versions of research. I mean, really, 
um, the prevent discussion takes place really, I, I, I truly believe this, it takes place on two discussions. The prevent strategy, when you're discussing, it takes place on two points. The first point is, do we challenge nonviolent extremists or do we work with nonviolent extremists? So before, before the current strategy, it was work with the nonviolent extremists. The logic was, you work with these nonviolent extremists who share the same views as, the, as like the jihadists, but stop short of violence. And they, you, they are the ones you use to de-radicalize the jihadists. Why? Because they speak the same language, so to speak, and so that they are more credible. And that was their reason for it. Hmm. Now, Quilliam obviously were very much against that, stating that these guys are more like fan flamers than firefighters. Yes, I'd agree. Because, um, because if you have someone who says, I want to kill all the Jews, you really shouldn't have someone trying to de-radicalize them with, Look, I know the Jews are pigs and they're kafar <laughs> oh, and they deserve it, but just just don't do it here, please. Please, promise. Yeah, sure. Um, so you haven't actually solved the problem. Um, so that's the discussion there, and I'll leave it there for the for the viewers and seeing what they think. Um, the second discussion is, how do, you, how do you deal with it? So do you deal with it through a civil society approach? Do you deal with it like the Prevent Strategy does now, which is about safeguarding and building community resilience and having that discussion take place and... Um, helping projects aimed at showcasing how intolerant they are and promoting um, good practice? Or do you rely on banning, um, which is something that is unfortunately becoming more popular today? So do you, do, you, uh, do you want to solve this issue by just kind of banning all Muslims coming into the US, banning all mosques being built, banning this, banning that? Which I would obviously say that is not the problem because A, it ruins our liberal fiber, the liberal fiber that we respect so much that it will be used to challenge extremism. But it also doesn't solve the issue and it also generalizes and um, creates a form of bigotry on all Muslims, not all Muslims uh, share these Islamist uh, views. And of course, even a fewer minorities share um, legitima legitimization of jihadist violence. So it actually hasn't solved the issue and it probably would, so and it would definitely um, help rise the far right. So then you've got another problem on your hands. Um, so really when we're talking about prevent, I, th I mean, I've really kind of simplified it, but I think those are the two key essay questions uh, people should be looking at. Okay, uh, last question then, and I think this is a really good one. It's, it's often a, a blind spot, but Madeline Hansen has asked, what can we do to ensure our movement isn't hijacked by the right wing? This is a very good question, because I think it has somewhat been hijacked by the right wing, because what's happened um, already, and that's something to be worried about, because Quilliam have done a lot of work, and I think this was probably its main kind of, um, its fundamental uh, message that it tried to promote from its very inception was that there is a difference between Islam and Islamism. That Islam is a faith and Islamism is the political application of that faith that will render non-believers second class. At best, pay a tax and at worst, be killed. Now, it's as different as social and socialism. Social being the way that we are interacting now and socialism, of course, being that political ideological framework. What we see now with the right wing, though, is that you get movements saying, look, look, I'm not anti-Muslim, I'm not anti-Muslim, I'm only anti-Islamism, but let's ban all the Muslims for five years from coming into the country. Um, which, hey-ho, it is actually anti-Muslim if you do that, because you're banning all Muslims from coming into the country. That's a, a general bigoted um, thing to say or advocate for. So that is, that is what is happening, uh, very much so. The other thing is... Um, the, what we're trying to promote is dialogue, but a respectful dialogue. I think that's something that we we've um, we haven't really highlighted enough. Respectful, and by respectful, I mean not something that's quite aggressive, not something that's so um, something that swarms somebody, but having that discussion take place at a reasonable place, in a reasonable time, and in a reasonable conversation. I think almost uh, the far right sometimes delve into conversations that are very quite aggressive. Um, which only serves to tarnish those people in the center who are trying to have that reasonable conversation take place so that we can kind of render the appeal of those ideologies. Um, other ways the right wing will hijack our movement is that they will also, so I should say the far right, they will also pick up on what they call, uh, what's the one I'm looking for? Not uh, so they will say that our movement isn't very successful. You know, the reform movement isn't working. Your uh, liberal way of um, challenging ideas aren't working, and they will say, you know, it's not working. It's not working. So now we have to re rely on banning and uh, sensationalist forms of kind of legislation and so on. That in itself is very naive, very simplistic, uh, because it is saying it is measuring a negative in itself, um, and it's 
something again. I mean, what, there are two problems with with the far right here. There's the moral problem of losing your liberal value by advocating such authoritarian legislation. But there's also a practical one too. I mean, if you actually have a discussion with someone on the far right who is advocating a ban on Muslims into a country, it is so far-fetched and so impractical that it just fails. So it's again, having that conversation with someone and having that respectful conversation that will actually, I think, put a seed of doubt and stop those people from thinking what they, what they think. Yeah, so in summary, sorry, uh, the right-wing people, the far right will try and hijack our movement by uh, manipulating the Islam-Islamism debate. They will also try to uh, try and tarnish the movement with shortcomings and will uh, in itself um, eat, eat away at the liberal values that we are trying to promote. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good answer. I mean, I think one of the things that perhaps I, I share with the, the, the far right is a sort of healthy scepticism of Islamic reform in general. I mean, I'm not, I'm not confident in it, to be, to be honest, but... I think it's a fool's error not to support it. I don't see why you wouldn't want to support liberal Muslims trying to reform their faith. And, okay. And um, I think the biggest concern that secularists have really is how do you go about reinterpreting some of the more darker elements of Islamic scripture to to make it compatible with your liberal values? It doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem that one informs the other in that sense. Aye. So. The first thing that you have to think about is there are three options um, in having this discussion. The first, obviously, is the far left idea of just kind of digging your head in the sand and apologizing for it, acting like it doesn't happen. Um, the far right, which is to basically, I mean, sorry, if you don't believe in that kind of reformist movement, then you would automatically think that atheism will dominate and that that's a plausible thing that's going to happen, that mm. 1.7 billion Muslims will just convert to atheism. Or, of course, there is that third alternative, the reform. I think, and I don't know if this is your perception of it, but I think one of the one of the things that might play into people's skepticism of the reform movement is that they believe that this is the only thing Qalim is advocating for and that this is a theological problem, this is a Muslim problem that will be solved by Muslims alone. It is not the case. Um, extremism is a human problem. Um, it's a timeless problem and it will be solved by humans. Uh, theology is one compartment of it. This is a human rights discussion. So why is it that you can get involved in this discussion as a non-Muslim? Is because you understand human rights. You understand women's rights. You understand uh, LGBT rights. You stand, understand religious freedom and individual liberty. You don't. You, you might not understand the hadith the Islamist is going to throw back at you. But that's not what the discussion should take place upon. It shouldn't be taking place on theology per se. In majority of cases, it should be taking place on the conversation of human rights. And so what is going to happen? for it to work is to build this coalition of different identities under the ideals that I was speaking about prior. So it's going to take the humane to counter the inhumane, the humanists to counter the extremists um, through that dialogue. That is the only way um, it will happen. Yeah, I agree. I think, I think one of the problems we have specifically in England is the fact that many liberal Muslims such as yourself are not given the prominent platforms that so-called community leaders and social Muslim social commentators are given because it seems that a lot of channels want to pull out the pious conservative Muslim to represent the uh, community. I mean, I, I mean, I'm getting a little bit sick of seeing Mo Shafiq or hearing him on my radio given his views on blasphemy laws and no one seems to challenge him on his rhetoric or murky associations. I mean, do you think the media needs to really rethink about the way it empowers voices in the Muslim community? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And so, I mean, that will only be done by changing perceptions and building walls down, bringing walls down. I mean, don't forget, Islamists duped most Muslims into believing this is what Islam is. No, sorry, most Muslims on campus um, to believing that this is what Islam is. But it's also duped the non-Muslims in believing this is what Islam is. So we have to now try and promote, hold on a second. Actually, this is just one over-politicized interpretation of Islam and actually there are human rights values um, in Islam and there are Muslim scholars and Muslim adherents who believe in those values and that we should have that conversation take place even more. Now we are growing. Uh, if you look at Quilliam, you can see that there are more theologians joining, there are more support, there is more support coming um, and I think that's because of a realization that there is a problem. I think more and more people are realizing that there is a problem. Even within the Muslim community they are realizing that there is a problem and so I think there is that discussion taking place. Um, it's not going to be an easy journey, 
but I feel like it is the only journey to both uh, to both challenge Islamism and keep our liberal human right values. Okay, I think that's a great point to finish on, Hay- Hayder. I really want to thank you for um, having this discussion with me. I think it's probably not this uh, discussion specifically, but I think this discussion you're you're involved heavily in is probably one of the most important discussions uh, of our time. Um, so thank you for joining me. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to get in at all before I let you get back to your evening? Um, no, just as a way, to, uh, just as a means for people to get involved. Um, if people would like to get involved, please do not hesitate to contact us at Quilliam. Um, there are different mechanisms of doing so in, in terms of getting involved, such as the Quilliam Circle, which I'm very grateful that you have joined. Um, but there's also opportunities to write, to write to thousands of our followers on our blogs, um, to get your name out there and to get your ideas out there. And there are also ways to get involved in student activism, which I um, coordinate the programs for. Um, there are many ways of getting involved. And it is time that we start becoming more innovative, more active, and more virtual in the way that we get involved. Thank you for your time, Hayda. Take care. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you again for having me on. It's my pleasure. We'll have to do it again sometime. Please. Thank you very much to my wonderful guest, Hayda Zaki, and thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash gspellchecker. Think we've all learned something here today? 